Well, greetings once again, poetry lovers. And here we are with our third Thomas Hardy poem. And I decided to start us with a, um, a, a poem that is, uh, I don't want to say it's distinctive for, um, for Hardy in terms of its uh, satirical bent, but it does uh, deal with a, a topic that, um, that he dealt with in his, um, perhaps one of his, his best known and, and perhaps most beloved uh, and, and darkest uh, of the novels, Tess of the Durbables, and that is the concept of the, um, of the woman who has, has been uh, ruined. And in this case, what we're talking about is uh, she has lost her, uh, her virginity um, outside of wedlock and what that meant for, uh, for women in, uh, in the Victorian age. <clears throat> it did not mean good things. So, uh, so let's go ahead and, uh, and read uh, then The Ruin Made. And, and we've got, um, uh, we've got a, two speakers here, uh, one that is addressing uh, the woman named Amelia, who is the ruined maid. And um, so it's a, it takes the form of a dialogue. Uh, the first three lines of each quatrain are spoken by a, uh, by a country girl who has, um, has come upon her, her old friend, uh, Amelia, from back in the country. The Ruin Maid. Oh, Amelia, my dear, this does everything crown. Who could have supposed I should meet you in town? And whence such fair garments, such prosperity? Oh, didn't you know I'd been ruined, said she? You left us in tatters without shoes or socks, tired of digging potatoes and sputting up docks. And now you've gay bracelets and bright feathers three. Yes, that's how we dress when we're ruined, said she. At home in the Barton, you said thee and thou, and thick un and theas un and t'other, but now you're talking quite fitzy for high company. Some polish is gained with one's ruin, said she. Your hands were like paws, then your face blue and bleak, but now I'm bewitched by your delicate cheek, and your little gloves fit as on any lady. We never do work when we're ruined, said she. You used to call home life a hag-ridden dream, and you'd sigh and you'd sock, but at present you seem to know not of megrams or melancholy. True, one's pretty lively when ruined, said she. I wish I had feathers, a fine sweeping gown, and a delicate face, and could strut about town. My dear, a raw country girl such as you be cannot quite expect that. You ain't ruined said she. All right, so, uh, so um, one of the first things you should have, uh, have noticed here is the meter of the poem. And it's, uh, so you would characterize these lines as being uh, anapestic, uh, except for the fact that, uh, that Hardy begins most every one with an iambic foot. So if you were going to take a look at these um, by feet, then you're talking about it's it's largely uh, anapestic trimeter. Uh, however, we have that um, uh, that that one extra uh, foot there. So most of the lines are 11 beats. Now um, there are uh, circumstances where the lines are not uh, 11 beat, and I have marked them there. With um, with the stars and and counted them out as twelve. Uh, so what he's done here is to have uh, have arranged the poem from a um, uh, a form standpoint into quatrains, and each quatrain then is a, um, a pair of rhymed couplets. So what he's done then is in combination with the rhymed couplets, which generally create a um, a sort of upbeat. Um, tone, uh, a sense of things. Uh, the anapestic meter is is also designed to to sound uh, sort of rollicking. Um, okay, now this is in in an ironic counterpoint to what is the uh, the point of the poem. Uh, what what is the project of the poem? So I've read some critics that talked about the fact that this is um, uh, one of his few satires and uh, and that it's supposed to be. Um, you know, somewhat lighthearted. 
But uh, quite frankly, it, it doesn't strike me as being particularly lighthearted at all. Um, and, and, and I've heard some, uh, you know, read some interpretations of the poem that say that the, uh, that the woman who's speaking here, the, the ruined maid, then is, is rather cavalier about, um, about her situation in life. Uh, but again, I don't read it that way um, exactly. And, and so perhaps as we uh, go along through this, let's take a look and, uh, and maybe we'll see what you think. Okay, so as you can see, I have marked the, um, uh, the poem um, there with uh, the, the first quatrain in particular. I've, I've gone ahead and, and marked the, uh, the scanned it. Okay, so it doesn't fit exactly uh, in terms of you know straight up uh, I am's at the beginning and anapests rather at the beginnings of some of these lines uh, there's some ambiguity relative to the stress and so I've given sort of the the, the medial stress mark uh, that you've seen here uh, which springs us uh, sort of launches us into the uh, into the stressed uh, syllables that follow um, because we've got rising meter again we know that this is a um, uh, relatively uh, upbeat uh, sense of uh, of the rhythmic pattern. So if we if we go ahead and and I'm going to ask you then if you want to submit these um, uh, this poem for uh, for annotation credit, uh, then I'm going to ask you to go ahead and um, and scan the rest of the uh, of the quatrains. But I'll go ahead and and walk you through this one. You left us in tatters without shoes or socks, tired of digging potatoes and spudding up docks. So you can, you can hear how, the, um, how that particular line is super discordant, okay? Tired, if, if, you, force the, if you force it into an I am, it's Tired of digging potatoes and spudding up docks, but it really doesn't um, it doesn't read that way um, well at all. It's it's more to the the point of tired. So here with the two beat foot, we've got the trochee that begins uh, here. Okay, tired of digging potatoes and spudding up docks. So notice spudding here. Um, uh, potatoes are 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 referred to occasionally as spuds. So this, um, this links these two ideas. The note tells you that it's a, a species of thick-rooted weed, uh, but the poor people would often eat things that, um, uh, that when you've got money, uh, would not be particularly palatable. So, uh, you know, so again, there are things that, um, that when you're hungry, you'll eat uh, in order to uh, provide sustenance for yourself. And now you've gay bracelets and bright Feathers three. Yes, that's how we dress when we're ruined," said she. All right, so I'm going to want, like I said, I'm going to want you to go ahead and uh, and mark the rest of these yourself. Um, and in terms of the uh, the pencil that is sponsoring this particular annotation, um, it is the uh, the black wing. Uh, it's that black matte pencil that I like so well because it just writes so smoothly. Uh, but they're really expensive. Uh, so the poor school teacher uh, can't afford too many of these, but um, they're nice to write with. Um, okay, so at home in the Barton, so this is the farmyard. So, so as you can see what's happening is that um, the, you know, the, the sort of wide-eyed uh, girl from back home has, uh, has encountered her friend um, in town, a town presumably is um, okay. Is London? All right, London. Um, let's see. A um, couple things to point out: fair garments. Um, so fair in this case means beautiful. Yes, such prosperity. So uh, the other thing to notice is this: he, uh, he being uh, Hardy is forcing in some of these lines uh, over on the other page I'll show you there you can see how he's forcing the uh, the meter to to end on a stressed syllable 
by uh, by hyphenating it. Uh, we know that uh, then occasionally you'll get a um, you know a stress mark to tell you where to uh, where to, to pronounce it or how to pronounce it. But here he's giving you the hint, okay, with respect to um, uh, to hyphenating the word to force the stress onto the end. Now you can you can ask like, well, why is he doing this? And and there seems to be um, I, I'm going to say it this way. There's a forced gaiety uh, or a forced, um, you know, upbeat sensibility on the part of the uh, the girl who's being addressed. Okay, so the addressee is Amelia, and Amelia, of course, is the um, from your note the, the diminutive form of Amelia. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, this is uh, people that are familiar with each other would would use the you know. Um, so instead of calling a guy John, you know, I call him Johnny. Um, so only the, the people that are familiars would uh, would do this sort of thing, okay? So, so again, she the the two girls that are speaking in this in this something like a it's not exactly a, a dramatic dialogue, but it's a dialogue nonetheless. Um, the the girl from the country in each quatrain is pointing out uh, a different aspect of of Amelia's appearance. Okay, so th I think that's important to notice is that what someone looks like, the things that they wear, um, uh, whether that's uh, clothing or an expression on their face or jewelry or what have you, uh, these sort of um, trappings uh, are, are often a mask for, uh, for what's inside someone. So what basically we're supposed to understand is that Amelia has, um, has traded her virtue, which was um, you know, highly... Uh, prized in the Victorian era, for uh, if you want to use the you know 21st century terms, she's a sellout. So she has sold her virtue for uh, for the comforts of being a kept woman. Okay, so uh, a kept woman means that it is a you know it's someone's mistress. So whether it is um, you know she is the mistress of a single man um, who is essentially um, keeping her around for. Uh, for sexual pleasure and and things of that that nature, or it could be a married man who is you know say older or something of, uh, like like that, and and it's got this um, uh, this this unrefined but uh, but beautiful young thing that uh, that again is a toy for him, um, and and she has has made that trade off because she found you know the the business of. Uh, of being in the country and working for a living, especially like grubbing in the dirt and and whatnot, as being um, you know not desirable. Okay, so so she goes through the the business about uh, what she is dressed like, um, what her hard life used to be like, uh, how she used to speak. Um, then the idea here of the um, your hands were like paws then. So if you're going to um, unpack that, uh, that simile, then we're going to say the tenor is um, Amelia's hands. And then the vehicle is paws. And then the ground, of course, um, I'm going to use the word appendages. So the uh, appendages of an animal. So here you can see that, and this is a question I'm going to ask you probably about that, and I'm going to ask you another question that has to do with um, what's the effect of animating um, the the old Amelia? Well, it, it's, it suggests then that, uh, that people who work in the country are viewed by those in the city, those with money, as being less than, uh, as being, um, you know, beasts of burden uh, type of thing, okay? Um, I think it's um, it's worth noting that that here your face blue and bleak. So you've got that contrast of colors. If, if bleakness means you know devoid of color, um, but I think it's also a, a slant on uh, on black, like you know black and blue. Okay, as though she's um, had such a difficult life. There, there's there's sort of the uh, a whiff of violence that you have there. But now I'm bewitched. Okay, to be bewitched is um, uh, to be 
be under someone's spell, as though you can't control yourself. And so this this doesn't say uh, good things about about the girl who is speaking here, because if she is entranced, probably as Amelia was entranced by the by the lure of uh, of money and society and all these sorts of things, there's a trade-off here. And so we have to wonder a little bit about um, uh, you know we're a little bit afraid for the girl here from uh, back in the country who is bewitched by uh, by the, the by Amelia's good looks and her uh, and the trappings of um, of the trappings of wealth although Amelia certainly is not um, is not wealthy in in the sense that any of this is hers she has um, uh, she has worked to earn it but it's in a way that is of course uh, not uh, acceptable relative to uh, to the society uh, that she came from. Okay. Um, now here's uh, here at, at line five. I want to go ahead and point something out to you. Um, you left us in tatters. So there's two ways of looking at that. One is that um, it is Amelia uh, was in tatters. When she uh, when she left, as in you know her clothing was um, um, was in in poor condition. And there's also the sense that it's the um, it's her people, her if you want to call them her friends, but um, we'll say her people are in tatters. Okay, without shoes or socks. So either way. Whether it's um, and perhaps it's, we're supposed to understand it as being simultaneously that that Amelia doesn't have these things and neither do the people that she left. Okay. Um, all right. So as we get down here to the um, uh, to the fifth quatrain, I think it's worth um, noting. You used to call home life a hag-ridden dream. So a hag is is a, a term that we normally associate with um, uh, with a witch. And notice. Okay, so this is clearly intentional on, on Hardy's part. He's he's putting, um, in, in this case, it's it's negative that the girl is has been bewitched, even though what uh, what Amelia used to call the home life as hag ridden is going to turn out to be uh, this sort of the honest work of the laborer. Um, you know, Hardy himself was from uh, from out in the country. And, uh, and even though he, you know, uh, received an education, um, and um, uh, and his mother was in particular uh, was intent on him being raised to a level uh, of education and stature that she didn't have, um, he still uh, centered most of his work on people who were uh, were laborers. Uh, those the, the, sort of the simplicity of the country life. And, and how that can be both a blessing and a curse, uh, because to, to live, uh, to be a, a simple, uh, to live a simple life is one thing, but to be simple-minded is something else. Okay, so notice the, the lines here that are are 12 beat. Before this, is before I go to the last um, the last quatrain, tired of digging potatoes and spudding up docks. Uh, th those lines are discordant, as is this one. And your little gloves fit as on any lady. I mean, it's just a completely uh, jangly line. Again, I think what Hardy is doing here is trying to accentuate the sense that um, that it, this seems uh, nice on the surface, but underneath it is um, uh, it is not. It, it's a uh, it's a life that's fraught with peril. And you'd sigh and you'd sock, but at present you seem. Okay, so so once again, this this line is um, uh, has an extra beat. Uh, we're supposed to notice the uh, the discordance in that. Okay, and then as we push on over to uh, then to that last um, pair of lines in the uh, in the fifth quatrain, to know not of megrims, uh, low spirits, or melancholy. True. One's pretty lively when ruined, said she. And of course, th th there's an ironic, um, you know, ironic sense here of the uh, of Amelia's tone, uh, her tone of we we can read her tone in what she has said. 
Uh, Amelia doesn't seem lively at all, does she? Okay. Um, now, it, we, we haven't really talked much about this, but um, I think if you if you will take a look at, at some of the acoustic devices here, um, you know, back here to the business of, you know, you'd sigh and you'd sock, but at present you seem. So there's a good deal of, uh, of alliteration if you, if you take a look at the lines. We're going to see here um, to know, so we have the, the the KN making the N sound and then not of the M with megrams or melancholy. So he uses alliteration um, for, uh, for grace or elegance here. Okay, and then as we get into the last, uh, the last quatrain. So here's the girl wistfully saying, I wish I had feathers, a fine sweeping gown, and a delicate face and could strut about town. Now this is what she supposes that anyone who is is dressed in this manner would do. So strutting is is normally uh, a verb that we uh, that we reserve for you know a peacock, the male of the um, uh, of that family. Of course, the female is called a peahen. I'm going to go ahead and uh, write this down here. Okay, I'll probably ask you a question about that. Um, and also, you know, roosters strut, yes, because they are, you know, uh, the male of the species and, and their, the, the colors of their feathers and their attitude and so forth is what's going to attract a mate. Uh, so again, you have that, that sense that uh, really in the female, uh, in, in the human species, it's the females who are normally dressed up, but in the rest of the animal kingdom, it's the male who must attract the female. And so here we have... Um, now for the first time in the poem, the last two lines uh, of the quatrain are reserved for Amelia. My dear, so she speaks in a, in a tone that seems somewhat condescending, a raw country girl such as you be cannot quite expect that. You ain't ruined, said she. So notice here from a diction standpoint, uh, she has reverted for the first time in the poem to uh, the sort of uh, of rural dialect that reflects where she came from. And so the, the sense of you ain't ruined, as in uh, a, a kept uh, a kept woman, uh, one that is paid again for um, in exchange for uh, sexual availability and uh, sexual willingness. Okay, so it's a, uh, the, the, when, you, when you think about the, the overall tone of the poem, it, it certainly is, um, um, I don't know. Um, we feel downcast when we when we read this thing. We certainly don't feel upbeat, irrespective of the um, uh, of the meter that uh, that Hardy's using. And again, this is an ironic counterpoint for uh, what it is he has to say. So there you go. I'll post that now.